Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome Stephen Jenkinson back to the podcast. Stephen, good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us again. Well, it's great to be seen. I appreciate it. Yeah. Where are you calling in from today? Are you in Ottawa? Or are you somewhere else? Oh, I'm really somewhere else. Yeah, <laughs> somewhere I might be jealous of. <laughs> oh, I don't know about jealous. Let's put it this way. The upside is I'm in uh, southern Mexico and um, uh, because I'm a pulmonary refugee. So in, when the winter time comes, I have to seek out different kind of climate than up north. But in the last 24 hours, there's been an earthquake and a rupture on the highway that was supposed to get me here in plenty of time to be able to do this. So I was literally running down the highway and trying to get a taxi and got here in the nick of time. And my life uh, looks like a Tom Cruise movie at the moment, but I think that's over and I'm in the chair. Good. Yeah, do you wanna just take a moment to settle in and arrive? Or is your soul still catching up with you? <laughs> It probably is, but I'm going to have to proceed without it for a little while. Yeah. So it sounds like maybe you've been visited by a few rough gods of your own. <laughs> well, none of them are mine. <laughs> On the other hand, the proprietary arrangement might go in the other direction. Hmm. What do you mean by that? I mean, I probably belong to them. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, it, I didn't exactly know where we were going to start today. Uh, there's a few things kind of bouncing around in my head uh, as I prepared to speak with you. Um, you know, as soon as I kind of set that intention, things start turning over in my mind. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you've probably been asked enough about death and dying and COVID for the time being. And so there's going to be probably a lot of opportunities if people want to hear you speak on those things for them to tune in uh, elsewhere. Okay. Um, yeah, I was wondering though, and this is something I've never done, but I was wondering if you'd like to start with something that's been on your mind lately that no one's asked you about, or would you rather start with something that's been on my mind? You know, I spend enough time with my own mind. I don't think I need to extend it any further courtesies for the moment and happy to begin with what, what occupies you instead. Okay. Yeah, because it's relevant for me, but I just don't know if, uh, if it'd be something that you want to speak to. But if you're open to it, I could share because it does, it does include you in the story. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> well, I wasn't sure like where to kind of drop in on this because it's, uh, it's like feels right now like a bunch of loose threads that I've been seeing if they, if they want to be joined together in some way. So I haven't quite clarified it, but it's been turning over in my mind. Um, I guess maybe where I'll start is when I was with you about four or five years ago it, um, on Cortez Island here in Canada uh, for the first week of the Orphan Wisdom School. And at some point during that time together, you were talking about things like ayahuasca, uh, shamanism, like neo-shamanism and yoga. And there was a bit of a derisive tone in your voice when you talk about things and even maybe some mocking. And certainly I think some areas of how these traditions and practices are being appropriated these days deserve some mocking for sure. But these things have been uh, quite special to me. So I was a little, you know, I was kind of bothered by that, wondering like where you're coming from. So after the talk for that evening, I waited in line to speak with you one-on-one. -on -one, and when it came to be my turn, you know, I said, you know, I hear what you're saying about yoga, like people from the West going to yoga and down to South America to drink ayahuasca and all that. I hear that, but, but these things have actually really helped me in my life. And you were really kind actually, um, there wasn't any of that mocking tone in the way you responded, but what you said to me has stuck with me for many years. You, you said something like, consider that your ancestors set you on those paths so that you could find your way back to them. And that was a perspective that hadn't even occurred to me. Uh, I've come from a very kind of fractured lineage. You know, I never even knew my grandparents on my father's side, for instance. Um, so never really a connection to ancestors, let alone 
an extended family of any kind, you know, outside of the immediate nuclear family. So I left that week and this kept, you know, I kept hearing your voice in my head. Consider that your ancestors set you on these paths so that you could find your way back to them. And I started to do a little digging. Uh, I tried to find out any information I could about my ancestry, uh, which was quite difficult. There's not a lot there, but I did find a few things. And I found a memoir written by my great grandfather who came from uh, the Ukraine, from a Mennonite settlement there. And they were basically run out of there and uh, offered land in Canada and the prairies. Mm -hmm. So a lot of Mennonites moved over at that time. And reading his memoir, I realized just how much of a devotional, spiritual person he was and a very, uh, had very high values, very, uh, a person with a lot of integrity, serving community, serving what he thought of as the greater good. Uh, and that really hit me hard because there was nothing like religion or spirituality in my immediate family, but it was something that was always calling to me. I had this innate religious or spiritual drive in me, which is one of the things that led me to explore yoga and shamanism and all of that. The other thing I found out on my mother's side of the family, my great grandfather on that side was an actual orphan who was put on a boat in Liverpool and sent to Canada to be an indentured servant as part of what we know as the Bernardo homes. And what I found out about him was that he joined the Masonic Lodge. And I'm sure he was looking for something like an extended family or a fraternity. Mm -hmm. But I also wondered if he may have been interested in the esoteric, in the mystery schools, these things that had captured my imagination and pulled me into them. Mm -hmm. And your voice would keep coming up as I'd find these things out, as I'd find these threads. I said, there's something in me that was in them, I think. And maybe what Stephen has proposed to me, maybe there's some truth to it. And the other day, I'm, uh, I'm learning a little bit about the pre-Socratic uh, philosophers, uh, reading some Peter Kingsley. Yes. And uh, he was talking about how people like um, uh, Permedides and... Uh, Empedocles were like these prophet healers who used uh, breathing techniques, incantations, uh, these what they called incubations, so going into a dream state in order to find healing and uh, become like an oracle, all of these very shamanic and yogic things. And as I'm learning about this, it's hitting home for me. Like, this is what I've been drawn to through the paths of yoga and shamanism and all of this. And all of a sudden, I felt like I was connected to an even vaster continuum than what I had thought. You know, two generations ago, my great grandparents being kind of spiritual people. Now, all of a sudden, there's something that the roots of the Western culture that I'm part of that is resonating with me in the here and now. And I'm sitting under the stars as I'm contemplating this, hearing your voice yet again, and this what if, what if it's my ancestors? And then pulling me far back in time, 2,500 years ago to my great, great ancestors. And a shooting star goes across the sky into the Big Dipper. <laughs> and it felt like, you know, there's this old idea that when we die, our souls become stars in the sky, right? And we look up and we can see our ancestors. And as I'm thinking about my ancestry and my idea of ancestry is expanding to go way back, you know, then to get this response seeming from the stars and there's your voice. And I was like, oh man. So, I wanted to share that with you as a way of saying thank you. Thank you actually for the kind of way that you teach, which is not like the usual way of teaching that we see out there in the world, right? Especially around these ideas of uh, connecting to our ancestors, which has become a really trendy thing these days. And, um, you know, there's all these courses on uh, ancestral healing and things that you can take now. Mm 
And I actually was curious about one of them and I, I signed up and poked my head in for the first session. Uh, but immediately <laughs> I realized it wasn't for me. I, I found it very kind of weird actually. It was a guy of European ancestry like myself and yourself, but he was coming from uh, the Yoruba tradition and offering these chants and rituals from the Yoruba. And it felt somewhat weirdly ironic to me that someone who has supposedly spent so much time digging into their ancestry and connecting to their ancestors is uh, using the medium of another tradition altogether and using another language. And it brought up things for me like, you know, if I'm speaking another language, will my ancestors even understand what I'm saying? Like, wouldn't it make sense for me to speak in the language they spoke? So all this has kind of been rambling around in my mind. And um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, like in that is like your way of teaching, which is different, uh, which is kind of like the old way of educating. So drawing something out of the student. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also maybe a piece in there if you could share your thoughts on uh, the trend of connecting to ancestors and ancestral healing. If you have any thoughts about that, I'd appreciate it. Okay, uh, first of all, you're welcome. And um, I'm glad it worked out so far, so good. Although I was waiting for you to dip into a little sarcasm and irony when you were talking about the thing you tuned in for, but you didn't do it. So still it's on, it remains my repertoire, I guess. But I think, <clears throat> I think the thing that, I mean, who cares if I, if I get upset or I don't like something? I'm not sure I even care that much about that. So my approval or disapproval of no particular consequence or merit, you know? Uh, I just indulge it from time to time as, as people are wont to do, uh, exercise the ability to dis, you know, vehemently disagree and then forget why uh, in due course, right? So maybe the universe is working out when that happens from time to time. But the thing that um, causes me great concern on behalf of my fellows is the easy availability of the great grief bypass. That's, that's the one that catches my attention. Now that's not to say that yoga, for example, in and of itself is a grief bypass, not at all, nor uh, ayahuasca, nor any of the other measures that I, I heap disapproval upon that particular day. By the way, we shouldn't let that particular day be a stand-in for me. You know, that was me on a Thursday after a questionable meal, probably. Well, I've heard you say things like that in, in subsequent interviews. Okay, but you can count them on one hand. Maybe. Yeah, definitely. So um, <clears throat> it's the way that by which they're employed, number one, and it's the generalized unwillingness to acknowledge the historical and topographical rootedness of these relatively easy to acquire, um, uh, fairly exotic things from somewhere else. In other words, I'm not being concerned on behalf of, of those people from whom those practices come. They've got plenty enough ability to be concerned on their own behalf. But I am saying that, uh, to the extent that I'm ever inclined to speak mindful of the people in the world who more or less resemble me culturally and, and otherwise, that even though I don't use the word we very often at all, but I think we have an enormous responsibility, those of us in the world who resemble me, to leave what's left alone. After all, we are the great combine harvester, culturally speaking, of the world and have been for a considerable period of time. And it's not clear to me that that kind of cultural cherry picking is that much different from those much aboard historical practices. Now, there's all kinds of personal exceptions and if you're talking about motivation, but I'm not talking about motivation. I'm talking about the willingness to put the time in rather than try to reap the benefit of the considerable time in that other people have, have invested culturally and historically and so on to discover these things, to fine tune them, 
to figure out what's noxious about them and what isn't, and then ultimately to turn it to the advantage of what? Personal realization? My own suspicion is probably not. My own suspicion is that the likelihood of it, that these practices and medicines and so on are there and have been nurtured over the eons by virtue of the realization that the world benefits when humans obtain and practice their humanity mm -hmm. in a nutshell. Is there individual benefit? Of course there is, but I don't know that that's the goal. That's the byproduct and a wonderful byproduct it is, you know? So <clears throat> I just don't see personally that there's much appetite in the corner of the world that I come from for learning grief and for grievously learning. And because of that and a few other reasons, I stopped being a teacher uh, years ago. Uh, I just found the practice somehow missing the mark of the age. I mean, teaching as a practice is very much a child of this time. And although I don't, I don't check, but I have it on good authority that there are teachers proliferating over these airwaves as we speak, multiplying in, uh, in radical numbers. Yeah. I myself don't trust the teaching conceit, the teaching arrangement, right? The, uh, the assumptions that go with it. So my preference is uh, one of a practitioner mm. than a teacher. It seems to me, and this is just an arbitrary way of describing it, it seems to me that teachers almost by definition are tending to do this, make these kind of gestures. In other words, they're indicating other wiseness and where to go from here-ness and how to proceed differently and, and so on. Yeah. In other words, it's they're kind of the great departure lounge from the way it is. That's what teaching more often seems to be as I see it and hear about it. Practitioners on the other hand, basically have one gesture, which is, could be this, you know? In other words, they're not gesturing beyond the present circumstance or the moment or the, the requirements of the moment. Their devotion is to the travails and the torments and the trials of the time they were born to. And probably as a result of that, not so much fix junkies or fix, um, what's the word, purveyors uh, or traffickers and more likely to be witnesses. Mm -hmm. And on a good day, I do include myself in their number. Yeah, I hear you. Um, and I, I knew teacher wasn't the right word, uh, but I've also been thinking like, what the heck do I call this guy? Because, yeah. um, you know, we went to this thing that is called the Orphan Wisdom School, right. uh, but there were no flip charts. There was no how-tos. There was no methodology. <laughs> there was no straight answer. We went at everything kind of like kind of sideways or something, like just getting close to it. Uh, and you would do that by telling stories. Um, yeah, I would say basically telling stories or digging into language and seeing what story is in the language that we take for granted. And uh, don't know. So it's not it's not teaching. I hear you, but uh, it is a kind of way of opening an inquiry or provoking or stirring things up. And yeah, it's like that question you posed to me as like an aside after a, a long day of orating, it was like a seed or something, or not even like a seed, something more active, like a, a hornet, a bee in my bonnet for the past four or five years. It's kept uh, stirring things up. And it's a great question for me to come back to. Like, yeah, so yoga and shamanism, all this, it's not about um, self-realization uh, for me, but what it has helped me realize is, um, I think Owen Barfield called it the original participation. 
Mm-hmm. And that's like kind of what it means to be a human to me is to be participating in life. Like you said, as it's happening to be responsive to life. And that requires like some openness, presence and curiosity, not knowing, like dropping the agenda. Um, so yeah, I hear you, but actually yoga and ayahuasca have helped me re- come to that, you know, realize that I still don't know who the hell I am really. You know, <laughs> something that's engaging in the world and always in flux. It's hard to pin down. <laughs> it doesn't do well at being pinned down anyway. That's for <laughs> zoological specimens. It's not really for, well, it's not for them either, but it's certainly not for humans. Yeah. Yeah. And I've always kind of resisted that. My wife tells me it has something to do with my astrological makeup. But <laughs> I don't know. But I'll tell you this, you have no obligation to resemble uh, the person that you once were. Yeah. So the notion of sort of characterological continuity over the, the length of a lifetime, it's, um, it's something that other people might re- depend upon you who are dependent upon you. But it's not clear to me that it's an obligation that we have. Yeah. I mean, I'm not writing a prescription for just personal anarchy. I'm saying that that a kind of uh, involuntary uh, sense of obligation to ongoingly be consistent leaves out most of the world. Yeah. Who has no interest in your consistency at all and doesn't admire you for it. Yeah, yeah. Everything else in the world is changing. Why shouldn't I? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as you, as you say that, uh, words of another um, non-teacher who I admire is coming to mind, Marion Woodman. And yeah. um, she was talking about her, 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 her uh, many year marriage to one man, but she was talking about it like it was a series of marriages, that there would come these points in their life where they had changed and they would have to come back together and kind of check in and say, um, do we still want to be, do these two people who are showing up right here and now still want to be married together? And um, I know you're working on a book now about matrimony, right? Right. And I wanted to ask you about that, actually. It was one of the things <laughs> kind of clunking around in my head, but mm-hmm. um, it's a question that I've been thinking about. Um, in terms of being married, I know, I think you're on your second marriage now. Um, and I was wondering about like, how do we know when the marriage is over? As opposed to maybe the marriage is asking something of me. Maybe it's asking me to change in places where I've been stuck in the past or to renew my interest in this person who's changing, you know, like, how do we know that the marriage is over or whether it's calling us to to do something or to show up differently i don't know that you need to say or between those two examples <clears throat> in other words they go together well right the truth is uh, well one of the truths of the the matrimony business is that you can only go so far as you at which point the the matrimony proper is basically done with the version of you that you presented upon entry. Another way of saying that is there are reasons you get married. Virtually none of them survive being married. (laughs) Right? And I'm not saying that with a sense of irony at all. I I genuinely mean that the thing that gets you to the door has done its job. It has no further work. Certainly no, no kind of work that entry into the the bone house of love, as I've called matrimony, would tolerate, you see. In other words, well, this is the third, in other words, you're familiar with the practice uh, in the death trade and beyond of people who are writing what are called advanced directives or living wills. You familiar with the idea? Mm, I've heard living will. I don't know really what it is. Very generally, uh, it's an exercise wherein a person is anticipating being fundamentally disabled Right. And therefore not able to make decisions for themselves as to always money and health. Those are the big ones. Mm. And so they appoint someone who will come in and take over from them 
at a certain point. That's the interesting aspect. At a certain point, and they arbitrarily at that time when they're writing out the form, imagine what enough already would look like. Right? Oh, yeah. No further, no heroic measures, etc. And the truth of, is that things look radically different when you get there. Right, and they yeah. bear almost no resemblance to what you thought it would be when you're heroically filling out this form saying, pull the plug, no plugs, oh, or man. whatever it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the parallel with matrimony is rather striking. Yeah. Okay. Because advanced directives are written by rookies. Yeah. Am amateurs. <laughs> Okay. You don't okay. know what you don't know yet. <laughs> and people walking down the aisle are rookies. Mm -hmm. Even if they're doing it for the third time, they know more about quote matrimony than they know about the person they're approaching. Mm -hmm. You see? So matrimony is much, very much like death in the sense that both of these are gods. They're deified presences in our lives much vaster than anything that we can come up with by way of a characterization and uh, or a, a, and a trip to attribute any kind of personality type to the thing and um and not that interested in our views of it see i would say that uh, matrimony is a living thing see but i mean i do this is a very long proposition but the very short version of it would be I dare say you've never been to a, a matrimonial event where anyone in the room, but the men in particular, were invited into the holy, what's it called? In the holy state of patrimony. I dare say you've never heard the phrase, the holy state of patrimony. No. The holy state of matrimony used to be part and parcel of the standard uh, church wedding. That was said all the time. I've never heard anybody object to the exclusivity of the characterization of that event as matrimony. I mean, the root word of matrimony is mother. Mm -hmm. You see, it's a rather particular understanding of what the endeavor is. And, and we ignore this at our considerable peril when we imagine it's a, it's a format for romance, for co- uh, uh, what's the word I need for back and forth romance that's not what it is romance may get you there but the chances of romance enduring the realities of matrimony are, are grim See, and it's mm -hmm. not clear that romance has much business to undertake once people have signed off on what it means to matrimonialize so there is a thing called patrimony and the amazing thing is it never comes up in the same conversation as matrimony does. I've never heard it happen that way. And this is probably one of the things that prompt me to, to wonder a book length wonder about the whole operation. Patrimony is a father function, not a man function, not a husband function, not a male, not a masculine function. It's a father function. So with matrimony, it's a mother function. So it's not an identity. So these are not two people uh, headbutting with their identities, trying to be radically themselves and letting the other person in on the great good fortune of uh, they get to watch you being yourself. I mean, the, the remarkable renovation that should occur and be visited upon you as a result of undertaking matrimony is a thing that doesn't survive the self-made uh, wedding vows that are out there now, which are all trafficking in basically the anticipation of one long good time with the occasional acknowledgement of, you know, hard time. But basically, we're doing this to upside our lives. It's a strange place to go for safety. Mm. I'm, I'm not sure the piece about patrimony. Yeah. Well, I just didn't get into it because I, I'm, it's not clear that we've got a lot of time, but let me see what I can do. So patrimony chronologically precedes matrimony. It always has. And this is where we get our, our, our kind of generalized the idea that the sequence naturally goes something like this. You mature or you do a good job of impersonating a matured person, number one. 
you you run aground on another matured person or the allegation of such, right? Your mo your forward momentum uh, ceases, and your focus of attention draws down upon that other person. For the moment, the rest of the world goes into eclipse, ceases to be. This is what most of the love songs are about. That moment and the great uh, elaborate lament of the fact that it doesn't continue that the world actually reappears on the other side of your fascination so how does patrimony work and why was it always a precedent why did it always come first that is first remember the rhyme the hopscotch rhyme first comes love then comes marriage then comes so and so and a baby carriage that kind of thing yeah there's a reason for that it's not just, yeah, let's do it this way. There's some necessity that's built into the arrangement and patrimony tells you what it is. <laughs> Very briefly, all mammals and humans are no exception to this. Their reproductive system is cued to food supply. Okay, so the more, the more routine and, and available and predictable the food supply is, the more the reproductive system is inclined to give it a go. Mm -hmm. This is true uh, at every level, biologically and, and symptoma symptomatically and so on. So no food or in other words, to elaborate it slightly, you have circumstances of social unrest, disorder, uh, a sense of sort of doomed well-being and things of this kind, very hard on the reproduction. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a demographic fact, right? Think, for example, about when I was a much younger person, there was a, a remarkable incidence and scramble to try to respond well to young women going through uh, uh, anorexia, right? And one of the side effects of anorexia is something called amenorrhea, which is the disappearance of the menstrual cycle. Hmm. Why? I just told you why. The menstrual cycle disappears because they're not eating. Right. And when the body weight and the body mass slips below a certain place, the body says, right, this is certainly not a good time to go through the ordeal of pregnancy, never mind childbirth and beyond. So you begin to see that there's a kind of there's a kind of order, call it a natural order if you'd like, that is has a high degree of responsibility to life that's stitched right into the fabric of it. Patrimony comes in from a human culture point of view to provide the, the requisite stability that the propagation of the species requires in the form of what's typically called often derisively the provider gene. Mm. That's in a, in a nutshell, that's what the patrimonial work is, is the provision of a degree of social and cultural and political and emotional and psychic stability that makes the propagation of the species and the personal submission to pregnancy and all of that make any sense at all. And that's why it comes first, not in priority, simply in chronology, mm -hmm. right? So what happens then when you have the Monsantos of the world completely bypassing the human reproductive intelligence and promising and delivering on cheap, bad food for the entire planet. What happens? Bang, in one generation, you have overpopulation. In two mm -hmm. generations, it's unthinkable. In all the so-called developing world, this is exactly what they've done. Mm. And this is their business plan. And it's demonic by a considerable degree, see? Mm. So, so then Matt, so to, so to unite patrimony with matrimony for the sake of this discussion, matrimony then would be the willingness of the females of the species to submit themselves to the arduous journey of bringing life to life, counting on the fact that they won't have to contend with the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune because they've been stilled or calmed or peace for the time being has come this kind of thing. That's the relationship between the two, very briefly put. Hmm. There's something too about the fathering 
uh, there's something about like limitations in that too, I would think, you know, kind of archetypally that uh, what you're talking about with this um, kind of illusion of abundance, you know, with all this like proliferance of bad food, there's a lot of it, but none of it's very good. Right. <laughs> there's something about that too. I'm not sure what it is, but there's something about maybe in the older sense, like in limitation um, and us not having limitations now or having problems with limitations. And, but if we get real, real about it, how much nur nurturance do I have available to me right now? Like how much real stability do I have? How much real security do I have? Probably not as much as we're inclined to believe or inclined to believe that we need. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's not even something that people want. Limitation, structure. Certainly. Um, Certainly. But stability is the visitation of limitation upon you. Sure. That's where it comes from. By its nature, it has to be limiting. Yeah. I there, mean, ha there has to be a boundary. <laughs> yeah. What real life is, is the end of potential and the beginning of actual. Mm. And what actual means is everything's possible and most of that shit will never happen, no matter how possible it is. Yeah. yeah. So, true. you know, I'm glad you brought up limitation because um, <clears throat> I'm mindful of this. I don't know where, how are we for time? I got one more story? Yeah, we got about five or 10 minutes, I think. Okay, very good. So <clears throat> I'm reading this book, I think in an airport, in the, oh, in the good old days when you could travel. And uh, it was an airport book too. So one of those kind. And it was the brief history of like everything, something like this. And uh, I took note of it, the title in particular. I, why do we need a brief history of everything? I mean, everything takes a while, doesn't it? <laughs> Isn't that what it is? But anyway, never mind that. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not that easy to please in airports. <laughs> And lo and behold, something like a year later, this was a blockbuster uh, sales event. And a year later, the same guy produced another book, which is something about the near future. Let's say, I can't remember the title right now. And, uh, and I heard an interview with him, uh, X number of years down the prophetic road that he was on. And in the interview, uh, he was asked something like, what do you see coming for us and he went right to of all things uh, the magic pill that will uh, diminish or uh, mortality's claim upon us the eternity pill in other words and he predicted this is a reality within a generation or two and uh, and the, you know the the interviewer was somewhat taken aback by his keenness on the on the matter and he said um, what would what would we become then this was the part that very interested me because I was working in the death trade at the time. And he said, and the, the author said, we'll have to come up with a new word because we won't be able to call those people human anymore. I suppose we would call them, uh, I think he used the word deity. What? Yeah, what? something like deity or very close to it. Okay, so whether that's that last one is accurate or not, but he followed through on his realization that it's, it's our limitations that render humanity to us. It's our limitations that give us the chance to be human. And when you begin to monkey around with our limitations, especially at that fundamental place that says you're not going to last and suddenly you could, it's a legitimate question to ask whether or not whatever ensues from that could be called human anymore. Because what are the limitations now? And how, how will you ever learn the mandatory limits which constitute you being a human and obey them accordingly? And then, yeah. and then proliferate accordingly, which is not much at all, with a view to the realization that ongoing human success has never been good for the world. See, so... So in other words, the responsibility of a human being in a time like ours is to internalize the limit with great discipline mm -hmm. and to be willing to live accordingly when you're surrounded by a, 
a kind of seduction machine that whispers to you that you can be whatever you want to be, baby. Yeah. Maybe you shouldn't be able to be almost anything you want to be and take your marching orders from the limitations that the world is pleading with you to take up and to respect. Yeah. You can be whatever you want to be. You can go wherever you want to go. You can live right wherever you want to live. You can do whatever you want to do. You yeah. can pray to whoever you want to pray to. Uh, it's all open. It's everything's possible. Uh, everything's the bulk bin at the spiritual hardware store. That's what, that's Ooh, the deal. That gives me chills, man. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. The this thing, is what I was reacting to when you found, when you were troubled with my tone, it was exactly this. Yeah. 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 But then we're left also with the problem of uh, some of us being orphans, right? And not having any user manual for how to be a human and not having any practice for how to be an original participation with this creation. And so who else are we going to go to? We can't just start from scratch, right? No. So right. my way has been to go and learn from others, <clears throat> but try to get to the essence of it. So not take on all of the cultural things that uh, require me to adapt or appropriate accordingly, but to try to get to the essence of it. Like what is at the essence of yoga? It's about being present, about participating in this embodiment, in this breathing, and through that participating with the creation of the world, things like that, you know? And if I get, get to the essence of it, then the label yoga loses all meaning anyway. Then it's just about, for me, being human and being actually alive. Um, so I just, you know, I still, I get, I hear you and I see the problem with all that reaching for other things and that bypassing of grief that you talked about. I see that happening all the time, man. I call it actually, um, you know, uh, John Wellwood talked about spiritual bypassing, right? I've seen, you know, in the Buddhist, what I think of as compassion bypassing in that they're using compassion to bypass all the anger, the grief and everything else, right? It's like, we go straight to compassion and we're bodhisattvas. That's like, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, so I hear all that, but also there's just that problem of us, so some of us having nothing to draw from, you know, no well to draw from uh, until we go through someone else's uh, practice or, or tradition or something. And then maybe we can find something that is just, I don't know, more archetypal, more uh, primordial, more just basically human rather than something cultural. You know what I mean? Maybe, maybe I do. Uh, this is not gonna comfort anyone who's listening, yourself included, but- I don't need comfort. <laughs> consider what the consequences are for people who have all kinds of ancestral references and availabilities consider how the world is doing in their corner. In other words, I'm assuring you that the presence of recent tradition is by no means an assurance that you yourself will have all the requisite uh, understandings uh, to, to have a benign consequence for the world. So it must come from some other combination than whether or not you're an orphan. I called my school the Orphan Wisdom School for a reason, because I'm acknowledging orphanhood is not having no parents. Orphanhood means you can't get to your parents from here. There's no direct line, right? So it becomes a learning thing, not an affectionate thing, not mm. a question of affection or proximity. It's a question of, of uh, pursuit, if you will, which you acknowledged earlier when you said, I'm not sure that being able to speak Sanskrit is going to do my Ukrainian ancestors much good. No. Never mind if I'm even legible to them. Amen, I say. Yeah. So you start with the poverty. And this is an arbitrary word, start. I mean, there is no beginning to these matters. You began slightly before you thought you began at the very least, right? Yeah. And, then, and then rather than imagining you can get yourself out of the dilemma by thinking the right thoughts. Hopefully the realization comes that thinking the right thoughts entrust the dilemma to you. And so the work begins. 
and then begins and yet again begins. And you finally, you know, cross the finish line, something of a beginner. <laughs> it's not a bad thing to leave to the next generation. Mm. Yeah, to at least have begun. Yeah, well, I don't see uh, an end in sight for any of this inquiry and uh, stumbling around in the dark, which is what it feels like most days. Um, but I'm okay with that as long as um, as long as it feels real, you know. Um, I'm not seeking comfort in uh, you know just Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. <laughs> okay. It's it's a way for me to kind of like stir things up and like you do. Um, so I, I appreciate everything you have to say. Uh, some of it hasn't been absorbed yet. I have to kind of sit with some of this. So I, I have no response really to some of it, you know? That's fine. It took me a while too. <laughs> well, that's why I like to talk to you, man, because you're like a little further down the road. You got a few more gray hairs than I do. Yeah, there's snow on the mountain. That's true. <laughs> well, I'd be remiss uh, not to mention these new albums that you've got out. And um, I've been listening to Rough Gods and I love it, man. It's beautiful. It's uh, your first studio album with Greg Hoskins and the, the gang. And um, it, it's great. It's different than the live thing, but there's still a beautiful interplay between the musicians and your words. Um, I, I know we're out of time. I'd love to actually hear about that process sometime, but here we are. No, no, you, if you ask me to uh, do it again, that's what we'll do. We'll wonder about that stuff. Yeah. Yeah.